I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Chris Aceto, the CEO and Chief Investment Officer of Gapsto Capital Partners, which is a credit-focused investment organization. Chris started his career as a management consultant and traversed over to asset management consulting in and around the founding of Casey Quirk and Aceto, today Casey Quirk. He switched to the buy side, focusing on hedge funds in the years leading up to the financial crisis, and started Gapsto in 2009. Our wide-ranging conversation starts with Chris's background and moves to the formation of a credit-focused firm in the thick of the financial crisis. We discuss the credit landscape today, the shift from legacy to new issue opportunities, an existential crisis in the investment-grade sector, liquidity, ETFs, credit as an asset class, credit-specific due diligence, and the next distress cycle. Please enjoy my conversation with Chris Aceto. Chris, thanks for taking the time to join me. Ted, pleasure. Why don't we start with your background and how you got into this this path to this credit-centric world that you're living in? Yeah. I came to New York in 1995, and I started doing management consulting work. I thought that was an interesting foray in, in terms of taking my interest in general business plus background in finance and economics. I joined uh, Booz Allen's financial services practice, and more specifically, their banking and capital markets practice. Worked there for three years, and in the course of doing so, fell into asset management. Related clients doing planning work from branding to credit risk management to organizational structure projects within a strategy consulting framework and set of, uh, set of projects. I fell in love with the industry. I thought that was the the path to partnership at Booz Allen. I suddenly realized that uh, that wasn't, and there was a reason why. (laughs) What was the reason? (laughs) Well, well, I I couldn't understand why they were letting this younger person completely take the reins on asset management projects, and that was because you had a hard time applying a Booz Allen, McKinsey-style business model when, in fact, your clients were companies measured in the tens at most hundreds of people. You know, it's not like working for a large manufacturing company where you're working for gigantic corporations where size and scope project align a little bit better. And it was one of those uh, situations where I was scratching my head saying, I really liked, I like this industry a lot, but how do I keep doing my management consulting work? It's, it's, uh, by one of those got the right headhunter call at the right time. And Kevin Quirk and John Casey were, were looking for someone to join their team out in what was then Rogers Casey to create a specialized business model, which would do management consulting work, but for asset management companies exclusively and allow ourselves to develop our own business model, our own staffing, our own intellectual capital that could more appropriately align with the needs and interests of the group overall. And and we started that group, John and Kevin and a few others had already gotten that group off the ground and we grew it. Uh, that ultimately transitioned to an firm called Casey Quirk and Aceto, which still exists today and is, is very, very successful as Casey Quirk. And that was a great run doing, uh, doing that work. Ultimately though, 10 plus years ago, I had an opportunity with one of my clients, specifically InvestCorp, to move over to the asset management side. And as much as I loved working with John and Kevin in the team, it was one of those opportunities I thought was was fairly unique and took the chance on beginning to create a an alternatives business within InvestCorp, which is a global private equity firm, private equity, real estate, and hedge funds. I grew to join out the hedge fund group and had a nice run. Of course, it was the big run up to the financial crisis and all was going terrifically well and, and growing. And uh, to bring us to the future, it was, it was during that period of time where I uh, began to think about what could come next. InvestCorp was a, a terrific place to work. But if I were to think about it, it was about that time where we were beginning to see the cracks in the, in the credit crisis. It was kind of interesting to begin to think about were these kind of trades, credit trades, an interesting set of things to be looking at. And, and that shouldn't maybe sound as surprising as it was in 2007. But if you, if you think back to that era, you know multi-manager work as well as anybody. It wasn't part of the traditional fund of hedge funds toolkit. It certainly wasn't part of an average institution's asset allocation. 
It was bits and pieces. Some distressed credit, corporate credit, yes, but a few mortgage funds here and there. It was nothing like we came to know it. And that was an interesting puzzle in my mind. While on the one hand, this seemed like a very interesting asset class, but yet institutions and other investors still hadn't embraced it. And there weren't advisors that specialized in this area. And that was really the genesis of putting A and B together of thinking about Gapstow to when we rolled out in 2009. That was our niche. We put... Again, the things that that fell together nicely were institutional growing interests in credit combined with a proliferation of opportunities, many at the time being distressed but quickly moved into new issue. And then lastly, a a set of traditional advisors that weren't as well versed in giving advice on credit. And we thought that that might make for a very interesting entree for for our group. And it turned out that the timing of launching the firm in 2009 was wonderful, right? If you're going in the credit markets, I think at that point in time, certainly the distressed world and some of these other markets were more long than they were sort of in hedge vehicles. And and it turned out that anything you touched then had a nice run. So the world's changed a lot in the markets and the credit markets. How do you map out the credit landscape? We purposefully try to address as much, cover as much ground as we possibly can. That was part of the business model, that it wouldn't just be advising on corporate debt, but really if you wanted to be a credit specialist, you had to be able to speak to consumer debt, household debt, mortgages, corporate credit, financial institutions debt, commercial real estate debt. And ideally, too, you would be able to speak to that in cash form, in structured form, public form, private form. And so we we try to look across all of those opportunities. And it has been a very interesting nine years, not to go through all twists and turns, but you were right. Clearly, it began in 2009 and 10 with distressed and rebound trades, beginning with uh, shorter duration corporate credit, which snapped back quickly. But you had some which ran for quite some time, RMBS in particular, CMBS, and other forms of structured credit that took a while to heal. And that was the big play. I mean, our goal and business model at the beginning was getting people in front of those opportunities as quickly as we could. As you're building the firm at the beginning, it's sort of notorious that whenever those opportunities look the most attractive, it's also, it tends to coincide with the time when it's hardest to raise capital. Yeah. So how did you, how did you get the firm off the ground at a time where you could see great investment opportunities, but at the same time, people were scared? It took a very good partnership, in particular, one institutional investor who we came into the crisis thinking that there might be some opportunities to work on together. And, and thankfully, those discussions continued forward. And that, uh, you know, so the initial, initial capital was shall we say, more or less organized. The challenge, of course, after that is, I I guess it was bringing ideas back quickly because you wanted to get in front of things and and that would compel people to take action. One of the things that emerged was the public-private investment partnership as part of the TARP and TALF programs that were being put together. And we could, that had such a short deadline. We could do one of two things, just let it go or get people interested and try to accumulate interest that, in this case, really did have a short fuse to it. So, uh, you know, it was trying to make people aware, combined with a lot of advocacy. You need to be able to draw attention to very compelling ideas amongst what then was a, a very confusing set of opportunities. Lucky in the sense that people began to see returns at that point in time, that forced their attention as well. So it wasn't it wasn't saying no 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 let's let's stake a claim here with the hope that in 3 years things will turn around. I mean that's expectations were set in that regard. But you know as yeah. as uh, again starting in March everything co- convertibles yeah. Yeah. began to bounce back and then you know t- going into 2010 as mortgages really began to to take off again that people were forced to pay some attention to the space because they, your, your investment committee was probably asking about it. Yeah. You know, well, yeah. I'm seeing all these returns in this area. Why, why aren't we doing anything right. here? So as that evolved through the original distressed corporate debt, the RMBS trade, which you know, to some extent still is happening, but really took off for three or four years, what else surfaced and how did you evolve from there? Circa 2012 into 2013, I think we began to make a theme of the firm from legacy to new issue. And that was a 
broad mantra that we spoke to investors about, the market about, but also internally steered our investment research to. And, and by that, I mean new issuance was going to be a very, much bigger part of the landscape than we know it right now. Let's get in front of it. That really pushed us into, perhaps most constructively, into new CLO issuance, probably less successfully into new issuance in the residential mortgage world. But we tried in all of those areas. And how does that idea generation come about? With the specialization in credit, it puts some boundaries around which you're looking. Now, those are it's still a pretty big playing field, especially as you begin to go deeper and deeper and deeper. But we've always had a, a balance between doing our own work that says from the top down, these should be some bigger themes, whether it be at the very highest legacy versus new origination, or drop down a little bit around inefficiencies in small balance commercial real estate markets that we try to think of compelling opportunities that should at the top level demand some attention. But being a multi-manager centric business, you have the wonderful license to go out and talk to some really, really smart people. And I think when you're doing your work best, there's an alignment that brings both of those thought streams together. And, uh, you know, some of the more interesting investments that we've done, I've looked back on, it's when we walk, we, we came into a manager said, hey, we've been thinking about this, or they said this, and, you know, our, our chocolate got in their peanut butter, and, and, uh, and they said, why don't we work on something together? And so quite often, especially during the middle part of 2008-9 into uh, current period, you know, we were fairly active in setting up funds of one with managers that, uh, you know, would do something a little bit specialized, something that they were very interested in doing, as well as aligning with some of the interests that we would very much want to take on. So this legacy to new issue reminds me a lot of this tremendous interest today in private credit. How does that fit into how an allocator should be thinking or that you advise people should be thinking about the place of private credit. Maybe to take one quick step back, because a lot of people have very different ideas around what does private credit mean. So maybe just to establish some vocabulary at the beginning, I think when we use, I guess at the highest level, we use alternative credit as a phrase, an alternative as distinct from traditional credit. So traditional credit, we group into investment grade and below investment grade within below investment grade, high yield um, uh, levered loans. And then we think about roughly three big categories of, so to speak, alternative credit. We think about uh, direct lending. We think about securitized structures and particularly where you're holding the mez or equity component. And we think about distressed opportunities, each of which needs a special set of uh, investment skills, different sets of opportunities, even though they they may overlap a little bit. And so depending on how people use it, I think what we're seeing emerge within the investor universe today is this the sense that uh, maybe all of those opportunities need to be addressed comprehensively. Maybe not IG, although we can come to that in, in a moment. But maybe I, I do have an interest in that direct lending piece of it. But should I address that on a singular basis, meaning build out a, a singular exposure to private debt into and of itself? And as you know, many allocators have, have begun to take that approach. Uh, alternatively, we also see some allocators, and I'm, I'm particularly thinking of the pension world, are beginning to think about all of those categories comprehensively. That should we begin to think about credit, first of all, as a standalone asset class, which is very different than history, up until the last two years, I would have a very difficult time finding an institutional investor who had a dedicated credit component. And that's, to their you're own. saying credit is distinct from a component of the fixed income allocation. Ab absolutely. Ab yeah. Absolutely. Now, maybe it's replacing it. That relationship is, uh, is sometimes dynamic for, for some interesting reasons. But, but a full commitment to build out a sizable set of ongoing exposures to credit. That's not to say people didn't invest in credit before. Yeah. Uh, but that, that, was, that was all over the place, though. There'd be a little bit in the hedge funds. There'd be credit exposure in private equity, especially if it was distressed. Some early distressed direct lending might be an extension of fixed income or something else. But we thought that was always a little bit suboptimal. We grew up over the last 10 years thinking about how does one make trade-offs across all the credit classes, private, public, different exposures, 
And, and how do you begin to think of that in a comprehensive portfolio construction uh, approach as well as a, a risk management framework that we think adds some benefits? And benefits, not only does it make you a better credit investor, but I think the highest level, it's making sure that credit is a big part of people's portfolios, which to talk our own book, we think is a very important concept. Just for fun, I'll take the other side. Right, It's so hard not to get the heebie-jeebies when... There's a gut feeling of yield chasing because rates are so low. And aren't those the periods of time when high yield, well, with rates low and, and high yield spreads low? Is, is that why now? Why is now the time? Again, I, I draw a comparison with the equity markets. Equity markets, boy, are valuations rich. So, do you, does a typical allocator say, you're right. This is a binary decision. I'm in or out of equities. I've never seen that happen. Right. <laughs> I've never seen. Why? Because we're not that smart. We're just not that smart as allocators. At the end of the day, you have hunches. You have good, more than hunches, good reasons to think that there should at least be a tactical tilt to the portfolio. But very few of us have been able to make that pure call on top of equities, top of the equity market, pure call on what's the top of the credit cycle. And if you believe, therefore, that a strategic allocation should have a dedicated exposure to equities, should there be some corresponding thought to the credit side? And yes, allocate and toggle between private and public, corporate versus residential, new originations versus legacy within that framework, but to keep that exposure out there. And it will do less well as markets come down and better as they go up, but we're never gonna get that timing perfectly right. And to think if we're gonna get in and out exactly right. And there are some people that believe it. And there are, some, and there are one or two people who have a proven track record for being able to get in and out sure. at exactly right at the time. But I think for, for most people, it is a commitment that needs to be made in advance. And so is this the perfect time to be building one up? In a perfect world, you started 10 years ago and, you know, now have a mature portfolio and can, and can uh, reallocate as, as need be. But we would argue it should be a systematic part of the portfolio. And I think really that is because it arguably is, is and could be taking the place of what that fixed income component yeah. always had. So you mentioned a potential exception with investment grade. Why? First of all, I think investment grade is credit. So I didn't want to exclude it from the credit landscape. And therefore, whenever someone has says, can you explain the credit world? We don't exclude investment grade to it. I think the biggest struggle to, with investment grade right now is its rates. Its rates and even with a risk premium for potential default, that combination is still so low right now. And I think allocators of the world out there right now are really going through an existential crisis as to what to do about investment grade. And, and I, I chose my word purposefully. Existential in my simple mind means a real crisis of why. Like, why is this? Why is it there? Why do we have 40% of our portfolio in this? You know, this, this historical 60-40 mandate. And I realize most people have migrated a bit away from that, but still, even if it's 20 or 25, why do we have this in here? Well, we have it in here because it's stable, won't lose capital, produces some cash flow, is not fully correlated to equities. I get it. And that was at the turn of the millennium when you could get five or five and a half percent for holding AAA paper and your actual return was seven and a half okay, you're right, that does all those things and doesn't put such a expected return burden on your equities-oriented part of the portfolio, such that it was a nice combination. I think with to get that same 5 or 5.5% today, you have to be taking below investment-grade exposure. What does it do to hold investment-grade at rates so low? Again, it, it's where it's very difficult to figure out how does that fit in. You've seen a couple of Institutions, In fact, I would say it's a little bit of a theme, begin to redefine their fixed income exposure, either as inflation protection or deflation protection in the case of fixed income versus floating, but almost having to create new roles for it in order to justify having it within the portfolio. And so, again, coming full circle from when that was 
forty percent of the portfolio. You know, that's a it's a very precarious position. Endowments, I think, have gone the furthest, where, as you know, they're they're down to. 10% might be an average holding for traditional fixed income. And some even have asset allocation policies that don't call for it at all, apart from cash needs right within it. So I, I think investment grade, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Is the core bond fixed income portfolio going away anytime soon? No, it's still, it's still fairly large. But I think for investment managers and their businesses, coming to grips with the fact that unless rates significantly move up going forward, I think there will be increasing pressure to again, answer that existential, what are we doing here again in the portfolio? And what are you seeing people do with those exposures, right? There aren't that many levers. If you own it, you're going to own it on leverage. You're going to own it with credit risk. Correct. And there isn't anything. I mean, at the end of the day, you cannot recreate a triple A, double A portfolio that's nearly going to get you to your actuary returns. Wish that was there, but we know that's that's not possible. So I guess the question, and coming back to credit, what what is pertinent? I mean, you certainly need to, or most growing corpuses and pools that need to grow are equity oriented. Okay, that said, the question is always, well, do we need to do some things that are not equity-centric. And I, I do believe that credit begins to fit into that world. And again, maybe this is where it's the newer generation of the 40% of that portfolio. Well, okay, let's critique. Let me answer the, or put the question forward before you say, but you know, high yield bonds don't get us there right away. You're right. And that doesn't, that doesn't. But between private credit potentially distressed if there's more of a distress cycle. Structured credit, those are all returns that begin to play at least part of the role that we think uh, that 40% of the portfolio may play. I mean, they're they're not fully correlated with equities, some of them very, not, not much at all. The question, I think a lot of times though, comes down to, but wait a second, I, I I've seen marks on CLO equity. I, 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 I can go to Bloomberg and price my synthetic credit exposure. That stuff moves around all the time. Why, why is an optimizer going to pick that? And I think that's where maybe people are going to begin to think a little bit more about their portfolio construction process. And is it all going to be about mean variance analysis using monthly data? Maybe to come back to what's an interesting 60-40 portfolio, one needs to think about, where's my certainty of return in five years? If I get CLO equity right and my manager does a good job with the credit, I can't predict the path, but over a five-year return, here's how much I feel comfortable with it. And equities, the dispersion of potential outcomes is much broader than that. Maybe there should be a role for something like CLO equity. Yeah, mean variance front optimization maybe doesn't pick a CLO optimi- uh, a certainty of where I want to be in five years. Maybe that's how that 40% needs to be redefined. Not perfect, but, but again, when, when Treasury's at 2-3, we're not in a perfect world anymore, unless people want to ratchet down the return expectations down to you know, next to nothing. And, but uh, I don't think that's going to keep schools and pensions uh, in, in business as they want to. Do you include in, in that universe, I suppose I've heard the label esoteric credit, so things like litigation, finance vehicles, and... I mean, there's probably a host of these. There's royalties, music royalties, farm leasing. royalties, leasing, airplane leasing. Is that part of how, how you construct portfolios? It isn't for gap sale, but I can understand why people would put it in there. Uh, at some point, one needs to draw a line in between where their research ends and we're leaving some things out. We've generally felt that unless we were investigating true risk of default you know, credit spread type exposures that we, you know, we would forego other opportunities. You know, um, insurance linked debt is very interesting. But in the end, after debating that, okay, they're called cat bonds, or many of the exposures are, we decided that that was not a credit risk as we would come to know it. And frankly, that we think we're good at finding, so we would exclude that. Leasing, we view as more of an operating business. Now, that said, all of many of the things that you just mentioned uh, have private debt-like elements to them, return relatively profiles, stable yeah. valuations, yeah, return profiles, cash flow. And so I can understand why people yeah. do put that into, into those portfolios. And within the universe of the things you are playing, as you, as you move down the 
either down the capital stack or down the liquidity spectrum, as the case may be, you, you scratch your head a little bit about two things that we hear a lot about, that trading volumes are challenging because of the street's contraction. And this whole wave of ETFs, particularly in things like high yield debt, is just a massive mismatch of asset liability. So why don't you take each of those, talk a little bit about the trading dynamics of these, and then and then a little bit about ETFs. Well, I, I think they're very, very real concerns. As much as the changes in banks, maybe uh, in the credit world, have been focused uh, in marketing pitches around, see, we're replacing banks in terms of lending. But I, I would argue equally important, in fact, more important for credit markets than the fact that they've pulled away from trading and supporting trading. And it's a very, very real issue. And I think we've unfortunately been lulled into a little bit of complacency because the last nine years have been a one-way ride with a, a couple of hiccups along the way. But even in a couple of those hiccups, you just you begin to see the fact that market liquidity can disappear very, very quickly. Think of the end of 2015 coming into 2016. I think they, they are very real. There's, there's data out there that obviously shows the, the diminution of what the banks themselves uh, will balance sheet. I think the implication is that one should be very careful about your holding horizon and if you are an investor in other managers, are the liquidity provisions of funds aligned? And again, I, th- I think a- everyone has learned their lesson from 2006 and 2007. Th- and I think assets, generally speaking, are in better hands and in better structures than they were then. But one needs to be concerned about always structures and what is the worst case scenario. And And I think that's why you're beginning to see within the credit world institutional investors beginning to accept and accommodate non-traditional structures uh, where if it's more quarterly oriented, I think they're accepting of the fact why there may need to be a very long notice period or a fund or investor level gate, and sometimes more than just a quarter. I think they they recognize that that is the way they protect themselves. And frankly, that's the way a good manager will be able to extract an illiquidity or complexity premium. On the more private side, I think investors are getting comfortable with this notion that there might be a shrunken PE type fund put in place where and there's a call period of two years, investment of another year, and then a roll off over two to three. Whereas, you know, that that may not seem particularly insightful. We're getting used to them. But it was interesting, even up until a couple of years ago, where if you would talk to a, an investor about structure and how you'd want to frame uh, an investment in credit, public or private, they'd get quarterly hedge funds. You'd get giving your favorite PE fund money for 15 years. But things in between were non-traditional, and they had to, uh, you know, really begin to get their heads around it. Now, I think people are comfortable enough with these intermediate duration structures that they see that aligning fairly nicely with credit. And again, people, I think, are getting much smarter about making sure that the manager really has that right structure in line. The second part of your 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 line of of questioning around uh, retail oriented funds, both ETFs and and mutual funds. Whenever I get the conference panel, what keeps you up at night? Panel question, what keeps you up at night? That's one that I often bring up. That's, uh, and not so much that I I don't assign a probability to it. It, 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 There's an uncertainty to it. We've never had as much individual retail, so to speak, money in the credit markets as we do now. And it's it's only beginning to proliferate as you see smart people begin to design closed-end and even open-ended funds for retail markets that are beginning to do multi-asset credit investments. And it is a big, big unknown. I mean, we got a little bit of a scare with the, uh, with the, the taper tantrum a few years ago. You know, we, we had some trouble in 2015 with... Uh, with a high yield hedge fund or two. The, the concern I think in my mind is as one thinks about, it, maybe it's a, a rising rates question, which is you typically build into your portfolio construction what happens if rates rise from a mechanical one. I can put that into the model and, and see my, my duration exposure. I wonder if you also have to be factoring in a different exposure should rates begin to really rise 
and retail investors relearn what bond math is, could there be some dynamics where you also have to recognize in those situations where there could be a very significant change in liquidity and pricing that's at a minimum temporary, hopefully just temporary? And do you think that ultimately undermines the or better alignment of asset and liability in the institutional structure? So you're talking about these sort of intermediate term vehicles in that certainly in the corporate world, some of these pieces of paper are the same. You have daily liquidity and an ETF and uh, very long dated liquidity, which could be for the same bond. Oh, absolutely. Because well, I, th- I think institutional investors and smarter investors are recognizing too that the liquidity around you, the way you structure your your investment, especially in the bond and credit world, shouldn't simply be driven by, could I sell this today? One of the beauties of credit investing is pull to par. If you get your credits right, you get your money back so long as you stay in the trade, eventually, at some point in time. Maybe coming back to my points earlier around the, thinking about it as the certainty of return over five years. You know, I, so, so coming around to it, I think being smart about liquidity, if you are, if you are uh, high yield sells off. Okay, great, let's get into high yield. And it's great because we can, it's with an endowment, having this discussion where they said, it's great because it's very liquid and we could get out of this. And I made the argument that said, well, actually, we should really treat it as an illiquid asset because as much as we think the return is this big right now, there's only one way we're going to be sure about capturing it. It is getting paid back when the bonds are being paid back. Now, I, I view that, therefore, a structure is a smarter structure is one in which you uh, literally or figuratively tie your hands for that period of time. And in a perfect world, give yourself an option to get out over time, but count on the five year period and, got, uh, and, and should all everything go right and you roll down the credit curve and, and spreads collapse more quickly. Have a, you know, a metric that says, OK, we take our money off the table here, but go into it saying, we'll need the full period of time in which to uh, to realize the investment. What's different over the last, I guess, eight years now in managing pools of capital in the credit markets? You know, we, we don't have to go into a meeting saying, what is credit? And let us answer that for you. Usually we dive down into something richer around a specific opportunity or a more nuanced view of how do I set up a basket of credit exposures. And that's changed a lot. And that's been, that's been exciting. And actually, that's as I look out the next five to 10 years, I think that's the next wave of credit investing, that maybe we've come full cycle where a decent number of investors have said, okay, you're right, credit isn't just opportunistic or catch as catch can among other parts of my portfolio. It's a dedicated exposure. I think this sets up for a very exciting time for credit managers. Again, credit managers who, um, apart from some giants who have grown over the years, you know, weren't very big businesses prior to crisis, by and large. Again, not fixed income businesses, yes, emerging some of the high yield managers. But now some of the folks that have begun to focus on alternative credit be they larger corporate credit platforms or direct lenders or folks who have accumulated a couple of these different capabilities. You know what, prior to crisis would have been a terrific business at three and four billion dollars. Now they're 30 and 40 billion dollar businesses. And so my management consulting hat says that's really interesting. How, how does one plan as a business for that next phase of growth? How does And, and you're seeing it, uh, in my own estimation, along a lot of firms, which is you know, how do you make that transition from boutique firm to be managed a little bit more professionally? That's not to say these people are unprofessional, but management becomes an issue and leadership becomes an issue and and people have to play important roles who maybe aren't just the senior investment person. Those are beginning to come to the fore, I think. And that's a very, that's a high class problem to have. If you look around asset management and ask yourself the question, among active investments globally, not passive, what's growing? And arguably credit, traditional and alternative credit are one of those areas that people are paying more attention to. So the assets themselves are growing. So again, as these medium-sized firms are looking forward, 
and they look at the vanguard of those few firms that have made it to the 80 and $100 billion mark on the credit side, is there room for a fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth of those? Could we do that? How do we do that? Interesting sets of questions. Equally important, not only do we build as we, how do we build the investments part, how do we begin to work with clients differently? And I think there's also our house view is that that is changing fairly rapidly as well. And, and maybe there's some parallels to core fixed income managers of 15 years ago, which is we are beginning to see the development of multi-strategy separate accounts where effectively larger investors are coming to credit firms and saying, look, I, I can't time your CLO fund versus your commercial real estate debt fund. I don't know how to time building a core of, of private exposures and opportunistically jumping on less liquid ones. Here's some money. Have it for as long. Let's consider it evergreen. Let's put parameters around what you can do. And Mr. or Mrs. Manager, you please make this trade-off over time for me and we'll align interests such that that is done very well. I think you're, you're seeing institutional investors who view that as a, a preferable model. And again, trying to find each one of these one-off funds. I think they, they solve valuation issues, they solve liquidity issues, and alignment issues in doing so. And I see that as a big part of, of the future growth. And I think institutional investors will no longer view some of these emerging firms as, oh, they have an interesting distressed fund or RMBS fund. They'll say, we have a bunch of credit investing partners, and what we do is we, uh, we step in and we allow them to use our balance sheet in order to do great opportunistic and long-term investing for us. And, and that's the way we want to work with folks. And again, how many people will be up to that call? And, and even, even if in the end it doesn't lead to that sort of omnibus mandate, just beginning to have that dialogue in a credible way, that is so different than as you might have interacted with a credit manager before. It's the way you interacted arguably with your core fixed income manager 15 years ago. He or she had analytics. They helped you solve corporate treasury issues. You know, they were your problem solvers. And, you know, I, I think by virtue of the returns, maybe that's receding a bit. Who's stepping into that void? Maybe it's the credit managers who are, look, I'm here to solve that problem of getting you to your actuarial returns over time. How does the portfolio construction work when if you put together some of the things we've been talking about, these markets aren't as liquid, which would mean that optimizing the portfolio based on risk reward might take time. Rebalancing can be tricky. And that also, if you need to have this particular expertise in each area, you have the same problem that, say, a, a, a multi-sector equity hedge fund has, which is each person has their favorite ideas. And if you want to rotate from real estate debt to private corporate debt, it takes a lot of time and you have people that do such different things that they're unlikely to be able to sort of cross over and understand the differential risk rewards. It is difficult. I mean, just like in equities, how do you get to know, you know what makes for a good residential mortgage person who today maybe is having to build a conduit to source non-QM loans and go to the markets and teach the securitization markets again about resi mortgages and do the first couple of deals and build that up? Oh, that's a lot of that's a lot of work. Um, on the other hand, I've got a corporate credit person offering me this really interesting opportunity in synthetic credit. Oh, that's that's a whole another other set of things. You know, how do I how do I put all of this together on a one off basis and look at them? It's a little bit of a challenge. I think there's also the portfolio construction question about okay, now that I've put them together, how do I in some coherent way say here's the risk across all of those portfolios? Again, equities relatively straightforward. Barra has been doing that for 30 years. Factors that are associated with the equity markets. What are those common factors within credit investing? I mean, there's, unfortunately, there's no great singular risk system right now, a part of, unless you're staying in a very segregated part of the, the, the market. Um, and that's, again, where I think you, I think that is a manageable approach. I mean, we've, we've always it's a little bit more qualitative than we would like it to be, but but we do sit down with our managers and regardless of the credit sector that they're working in, try to understand market sensitivities, 
exposure to interest rates, exposure to spreads, exposure to fundamental events, the ability to potentially trade, um, and, and try to establish at least a common mapping of what are the drivers of return, both to see when you are overlapping too much in one area, as well as uh, making sure that you are finding as many diversified pieces within that overall. No, it's 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 a challenge. That Again, I, I think that unfortunately works a little bit against credit right now, because if you go to your typical investment committee, there are 10 guys and gals who know equities. They're private equity people. They're uh, hedge fund managers. They're long only managers. You rarely get to the committee where of the 10 people, six are credit people. And that's a, that's a bias, but, but that is changing as well. I think as investment committees actually reach out to people who have a, a general knowledge. And, and just as on your committee, you, used to lo- you like to have a venture person, a private equity person, a public markets person, a long short person. Now, hopefully people are saying it's great to have a structured credit person, a direct lender, a real estate debt person, and, and build out the, the set of portfolios that way. Are there particular characteristics where managers trip up that you know, being someone focused as an allocator on credit managers, you might see that you think the casual endowment foundation, fund to funds, whoever it is that has a little bit of distress every now and then will miss? Number one that jumps out, Ted, is this is different manager and strategy due diligence than many allocators are used to. Allocators are used to analyzing hedge funds and long-only firms. Public markets understand trading, understand the valuation issues associated with it, understand the dynamics and the liquidity of those markets, and importantly, have developed a qualitative sense for what's a good manager, where, where there are ideas like. Credit investing is very different in that it looks more like a bank. Yes, particularly when you get into the new origination elements of, of investing or, or maybe prop trading to some extent, but just take on the direct lending side. When you walk in to evaluate a direct lender, you're not going to go far if you're saying, you know, well, talk to me about who's the trader and, and who's the head PM. They'll say, well, here are my 20 originators and here are my 20 underwriters. Well, what do they do all day? How do they how do they make this happen? And it's an understandable process. In fact, it's it's very fundamental and very straightforward. But one needs to look at a number of them over time to be able to say, oh, this is this is why they're different than these folks. Oh, this is this is a seasoned person. I used to think this person was seasoned. This is really seasoned right now. Oh, I get it. They're doing more sponsored lending as opposed to non-sponsored? Uh, do they have the right coverage to do that? You know, developing those, the, that background and that set of experiences, I think, is is probably the bigger transition for doing manager evaluation. Again, it's more like looking at how you might take apart a small bank and how are they funded? You know, oh, wow, actually, that's, that's an interesting question. Do I ask that as much as I should on uh, other investments? I think the, the other part that people need to be aware of What's the right tenor? And well, I, the market right now is is still not fully set on what is that right balance between lockup period fees and how much liquidity I I, I need to have put all put together, and, and, and that will be answered with time. But partly, I think people are now becoming familiar with what private lending and, and private credit and alternative alt- returns look like, and they're coming in good. You know, maybe we thought they were heroic at first. They're coming out fine. Okay, fine was different than heroic. You know, did I need to give that manager more of a reinvestment period because actually they didn't have time to recycle capital, so I got that back too quickly. The IRR was good, but I did a lot of work for a 1.1 times multiple on my invested capital. Oh, maybe I should rethink that. Okay, but returns are probably going to be a bit lower. How do I rethink management fee? But I want an incentive. Oh, but wait a second. These funds are very resource intensive. Maybe the management fee is more important. than the, 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 Again, we're all coming to grips with what that looks like. How long are these funds going to be around? I think people at the beginning were very optimistic. They'd be wrapped up within four to five years. They're not wrapped up within four <laughs> to five years. Right. Uh, what, what is that tail provision? Can we think creatively about how do we avoid tail positions? In, in credit funds, um, you know, a lot of lot of things that uh, again, I, smart people knew about, but we're only coming to the end of 
the resolution of the first generation of, I'm, I'm thinking more of the, particularly the private credit funds. Yeah, and structured credit too. And, and structured yeah. credit as well. And we're only midstream through the re-ups to many of the managers. So yeah. it's only natural that we're beginning to, to think through many of these issues. What opportunities in the markets are you most excited about today? Really, really hard question. Again, I, that stands in contrast to uh, the last eight to nine years where I would pound the table about one or two things every year that just were even better than some of the other things we were looking at. It's a really difficult time for what are the credit opportunities that uh, we see there. First of all, I, we are believers that you should always have exposure to credit. And so the, the, the idea that you will keep, it, it's, it's not binary. You know, on the less liquid side, I think... Now is the time for people to think about extending themselves out a bit. Most people have private credit portfolios built around middle market direct lending. Great first place to start. Makes a lot of sense for that. What can I be adding to that to make sure that I'm not just hitting the same set of exposures over and over again? Should it be commercial real estate debt? Are there some specialty lending provisions? Some of the uh, the other strategies like royalties, should I be beginning to fill that out so I have a sl- more diversified bucket? And I think that's a very good call for most people in the in the private credit area. Secondly, I think it's it's um, well, I, I can only speak our own book on this one, which for the first time in eight years, we've in the allocations that we are allowed to make to more liquid, more quarterly oriented funds. It's the first time in eight years we've really looked at long, short, and low net managers as a bigger component to the portfolio. And lastly, I think this is the time when you begin to think about, does one raise cash? Or in the case of certain funds where the structural IP, should you be more aggressively giving cash back and beginning to pause a bit and take some of your exposures down a little, not fully, but down a bit, and preserve the liquidity for what may be you know, a more interesting set of opportunities to come up. And again, I, I'm not calling market top. Wish I could, but it would be uh, advice that we would give uh, right now. And that's not to say completely out, but uh, but preserving liquidity, maybe taking a little bit of a lower expected return in order to uh, preserve the, the optionality going forward. How have you improved the way you make decisions? And has it come from what you've seen on your team? Has it come from what you've seen on external managers? Some of the good lessons learned, the six or seven people who work on our investment team, we meet all the time. Twice a week, formal meetings, we rarely miss them, uh, Mondays and Fridays. Mondays are more oriented towards research, both manager research as well as industry research and markets research. Friday is more oriented towards portfolios. So we, we sit down every Friday with a different one of our portfolios and pretend we're having a client meeting and say, here, remember, here's our plan. Here's how we're working forward. Here are the decisions we're making. Are we spending enough time with each of the portfolios? We have to spend a lot of time together. And therefore, you get the general cross-pollination of good thinking of ideas. And that comes because we're all asked to do a little bit of specialization. So amongst our team, one person, she specializes in portfolio construction and looking at risk. Great lens to have. Uh, Someone else focuses on small banks and investments related to smaller financial institutions. One person on structured credit, one person on corporate credit, one person historically more on private credit. And this is when we come together and we think about what's going on on the things that we're responsible for. One of the lessons learned, Ted, I think is very good to combine publics and privates. It's really interesting to have somebody who has spent a lot of time recently thinking about CMBS, discussing what that outlook looks like relative to somebody who's been spending time with direct commercial mortgage originators. And to see what's that better trade that goes back and forth as to what's you know more appealing on a on a go forward uh, basis. I think having that segregation of duties and requiring people to make the case within asset classes that they don't own wholly. The, the, the asset class is lending to people who buy and reconstruct buildings. Okay, we can play that in a couple of different ways. How do we how do we do that? Actually, why, why limit it to those two people? The gentleman who covers banks for us. He just came back from a roadshow speaking to 15 community bank lenders. What are they saying about commercial real estate in their local areas? To get that multifaceted view, which, which again, maybe is, happens in a perfect world in other areas, but, but certainly the, 
my background a little bit at InvestCorp was was working within the fund of hedge fund group, and that would, that got to be a very segregated set of activities, as it, as it did with every allocator, which is somebody who very narrowly focused on a strategy. And you know, sometimes you you wonder, did you lose? Do you lose? And again, that was having to cover a lot of broad ground, but being able to gain the, the synergies of looking at a borrower class, but through multiple guises, I think is very helpful in credit. So do you have a view of what the next default cycle looks like? I know what it won't look like. It won't look like the last one. And Defined by well, but no 2008. <laughs> no, in 2008. No, no, no. But, yeah, yeah, but yeah. no defaults at the end of the day. It just looked <laughs> like there were going to be a lot. I am convinced that most people believe I'm waiting for the next 2008 yeah. nine to happen. Sure. And thankfully, that's not going to be the next cycle. And I think for people who are going to wait for the apocalypse, apocalypse two to happen, I, I just are not going to get money to work. It's it's not going to be there, and they're going to be looking for something that won't happen again. Arguably, we had one. I mean, 2014 to 15, 16 in the energy sector, that looked like a distress cycle. Oh. Huh. That's interesting. That's a distress cycle that was pretty severe in an industry during which the rest of the economy was growing pretty well. Maybe the same thing's happening in retail. Uh, maybe, right. maybe the next distress cycle is called the Amazon distress cycle. Yeah. Well, again, where you Everything have but, severe yeah. displacement of certain industries happening during a period of time in which the broader economy is doing fine. But, but it's, it's not the last one. And I think one has to be aware that it will happen in certain areas and be ready to address those, even though, you know, you're not seeing it in the, the broader data overall. Yeah, and that Amazon cycle, which I'm sure is happening, feels different, right? Because it's not all of retail that's in distress. It's all of non-Amazon retail. Mm -hmm. And you have a real estate problem embedded in that. And it's a tough one. It is a tough one. No. But now an active manager should say, but that's perfect, right? Because I got a long and I got a short. And your distressed person should say, that's great. That's why I get paid. I'm going to sort that out. And that's a big trend. And I should be able to, to see that. You shouldn't get to the end of the oil and gas cycle and say, oh, I missed that one. Or I didn't know that was a distress yeah, I mean, these cycle. Days, there's so much money on the sidelines that the issue is who dove into first. Right, right. Well, and, and, and that, well, that, that could be. I mean, we had people raising money for European NPL six years ago, and maybe it's now. I've heard a couple of good pitches for, no, 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 this time it's it's really here. So uh, I, I don't mean to pick on our manager. I think everybody that's, uh, you should not be waiting for 2008 again. That, that's, that I'm pretty sure about overall. Let's turn to a couple of fun closing questions, yeah. Chris. What is your favorite sports moment, either as a participant or a fan? As a participant or a fan? Well, I, I, I do live a little vicariously through my teenage son's soccer these days. Personally, you know, I, I played rugby throughout college and, and a little bit afterwards. And uh, that I look back on with very, very fond memories. I was small and, and slow, but apart from that, was an okay player. And uh, just uh, terrific memories of a lot of camaraderie, a lot of occasional accomplishment, uh, not often, but, but occasional, and the excitement that comes along with playing a, a team sport. Was there a moment? A moment. Yeah, I remembered my favorite moment was my freshman year, and I just made the A team, and I was playing in the backs, and out of nowhere, someone threw me the ball. <laughs> and I just kept running. And, you know, I hadn't been hit because I'd been hit a lot that day. And for some reason, no one had quite hit me. And the thrill of touching the ball down over the line, I remember it distinctly. I can picture it very clearly in my mind right now. It was a, a lot of fun. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? I don't know if I can think of a specific line, Ted, but there was no question in my family growing up that the the best solution to any situation was the creative one. And maybe to put that in a little bit of context, my, uh, my, my, my family are all performing arts people. We got opera singers, playwrights, novelists, uh, several musicians, several music teachers, actors. 
I, I am the black sheep. I'm literally considered the black <laughs> sheep in the family for having gone into the very uncreative world of financial services. You know, family gatherings were always built around all of that. Not talking about credit investing, believe it or not, I, I can't get there. So, so when you grow up in a family like that, it was I, I never remember being pushed to get good grades or push to hit certain sets of accomplishments. It was, you know, the praise was given when you did something really creative. When you, you know, you did the play in a slightly different way, or frankly, you went out for the play as opposed to doing something else. When you, you know, played in in the band or you wrote an essay in a completely off the wall manner, that got praise at home, regardless if it was particularly good or not. It was the effort and it was the the enthusiasm, which I I, I, I try to explain to my relatives when they do say, you know, well, all right, what's Mr. Boring up to these days? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I've taken some of those lessons. Look, look at what we did here. This was kind of interesting and this was a little bit out of the box. Uh, so uh, so I, I, I uh, as much as my relatives don't believe it, I, uh, I do actually carry that with me. What reading do you do periodical website whatever it is that other people might not know about that you find very informative so professionally personally actually i've been doing a lot of recent re- reading recently because i uh, made it a goal for the next two years to keep up with my kids reading my kids are both in and teenagers and so i've been rereading all the classics oh, wow. along That's with them great. it has been I've, I've been very good about the shorter classics not the not all the <laughs> the longer uh, whether are you, are you I, 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 mean, I did not get uh, did not get all the way through you know on on the professional side you know w- one thing I, I i have found very helpful recently is spending a bit more time looking at what some of the public pensions put on their websites because of uh, let alone freedom of information act but more a lot of them are just here's what we post i think it's a very interesting perspective on the world where you have allocators who have to be fairly transparent with what they're doing and to actually get to read in almost live time, certainly not with too much of a lag, you know, how people are thinking and how are they changing asset allocation. It's very interesting. That's a terrific set of case studies to be able to put together and read, and especially when you put together six, seven, 20, 25 of them, and you can be dreamed to draw some lines and, and, and learn about where things are going. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? Grades don't matter that much. <laughs> not, to, not to be facetious, and uh, I'm, I'm fairly confident my kids are not going to listen to the podcast because uh, <laughs> credit investing is not there, so, so maybe they won't hear this one. And, and that is, of course, a catch-all for reminding oneself that uh, as one goes through life, whether it be college or other points in time, that... Uh, you sometimes put your nose down and you focus on what's right ahead of you and you focus on what you assume is what everybody else is the right thing to get out of it. When, in fact, things like building relationships and uh, you know taking the time to think big picture, that's not necessarily antithetical to getting good grades. But if you look back on your many stages of life and say, did I get the best grade or did I make the most relationships? Actually, the relationship side, of course, wins. Again, you don't know that. Most of us learn that in life and hopefully we don't learn it too late. All right, last one. It's your waning days. You are 105 years old, <laughs> sitting in a rocking chair. Yes. What advice would you give yourself today? The best advice I could give I have learned about grit over time, and I think that 105-year-old would have a much bigger impact on me telling me about grit at 105 and looking back and being able to say, I have a few instances now to tell you about where tenacity and stick to win over the long term. Not, not two or three weeks, but kind of five and ten year stick to And, you know, let us go through a couple of examples where you chase the shiny object, What's that balance that you that you need to learn? Occasionally, you need to chase that, but the tenacity of being able to stick with ideas over longer periods of time, especially if you bring enthusiasm and intelligence to them, pay off over over longer periods. And I, th- I think I'm kind of halfway through learning that, so I, I would hope at 105, I really, really would have learned that one. Looking back, Chris, thanks so much. It was a lot of fun. Ted, thank you. Enjoyed it. 
Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you've liked what you've heard, please write a review on iTunes or Google Play to help others find out about the show. Have a good one and see you next time. Thank you.